morning, everybody, and welcome here uh, to the Boole Library at UCC. My name is Alison O'Connor. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be moderating here this morning. I am a Cork woman that lives in Dublin, a West Cork woman, I should specify. Um, and I, it was subconscious that I wore a red jacket this morning. And I'm surprised my family didn't take me up on it, as they often do uh, for anything, any bit of Cork pride that ever shows through. But anyway, uh, welcome uh, to this event this morning here at UCC with the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs, Forging Partnerships, Ireland and Lithuania in the EU 27. So we're looking this morning at the question relating to the future of Europe, which really at the moment, uh, unless you're living under a rock, uh, you'd realise it's the million dollar question for all of us. Uh, and I suppose within that, there's the danger that Brexit, we all just look sort of as we have for centuries in that one direction towards, towards the UK and that it overshadows all else. So I suppose if there's a silver lining here, it's that we are, and with the encouragement of the government and organisations like the IAEA, looking around, above and beyond Britain to the rest of our European neighbours. Uh, many years ago, um, I spent time in Paris, went a year in Paris doing a journalism course, Journalist en Europe, which unfortunately no longer exists. But it really made me realise, being based there, how in the middle of Europe you looked all around you. Whereas when you're based in Ireland, you really do, there's that island mentality and you have to make a big effort to, uh, to make your, your, your vision more global, I suppose, more European. This particular event this morning is part of the IIEA Future of the EU27 project and that is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It's the second regional event that's been held. The first one was in Maynooth University last November and you'll notice that on both occasions students were involved. We have a number of students who, who will be uh, speaking later on uh, this morning and very keen to answer questions and give their view of Europe and the EU and the future. I think is an excellent idea. Now, I would like to welcome uh, the Lithuanian uh, foreign, excuse me, foreign affairs minister Linus Linkavicius. Have I pronounced that almost, correctly? Almost, almost nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very. That is very charming of you. Thank you very much. Now, as you know, our own foreign affairs minister Simon Coveney was billed to be here this morning. Uh, but at fairly much at the last minute had to, had to go to Belfast on what I'm sure we'll all agree is extremely uh, important business today and we'll hope that um, while we're suffering his absence that it will result in the restoration of power sharing and he has been very ably replaced by uh, Minister of State David Stanton who is, who is, uh, who is sitting there in, in his stead. So I'd ask you all if you wouldn't mind to put your phones to, uh, on silent just so that we won't have any interruptions. Uh, we'd be delighted uh, for any of you who would like to tweet on the, on the event. The hashtag is Future of Europe. And my uh, first official task is to invite uh, Dr. Mary Murphy uh, to the podium. Mary is a lecturer in politics of the Department of Government here in UCC and really is, I suppose, the main person responsible for this event this morning and for, for it being held and coming together. Mary specialises in the study of the EU and Northern Ireland politics and her next book, Europe and Northern Ireland's Future, Negotiating Brexit's, Brexit's Unique Case, will be published in 2018. So, Mary. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to today's event. Um, a Cade Meal of Falcha, 100,000 welcomes to, uh, to our special guest, Foreign Minister Linus Linkiewicz. Right. <laughs> uh, and Thank an equally, equally warm welcome to, to your delegation to UCC today. We're very pleased that you've chosen to visit University College Cork and, and to come to Ireland's second city. I know that you yourself have roots in Lithuania's second city, so it's great that second cities can join main forces. City, main city. Main city. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are almost 200 Lithuanian students uh, registered as students here in UCC, so uh, you should feel somewhat at home. Uh, well, welcome also to Minister David Stanton, uh, mm. who has very, very generously stepped in at short notice to replace Minister Simon Coveney. Um, thank you for being, being here, and please pass on our best wishes to Minister Coveney. We all sincerely hope that his trip to Belfast will result in progress today. Uh, both, both ministers um, are here today to talk about the future of Europe. And although Ireland and Lithuania may be far apart in geographical terms, 
uh, we do share some similarities in terms of our history, but maybe also in terms of our visions for the future of Europe. Uh, we look forward to hearing how we might forge future partnerships in terms of articulating and defending our shared interests. I'd also like to express a very warm welcome to the Irish Institute for International and European Affairs, who with the support of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade have been instrumental in the organisation of today's event. We're very pleased to welcome the IIEA to Cork um, and we hope you will come back soon and that you'll come back often. The Future of Europe Dialogue poses very important questions about economics, about security, about Europe's future social model, etc, etc. And arguably all of these issues are particularly important for Europe's smaller member states. And that's why events and opportunities like this are so very important, particularly for students and for young people. Uh, the size, I think, of this morning's audience really is a testament to that. And I want to applaud our student uh, participants here on the stage today. We really do look forward to your contributions and uh, we thank you for, for, for your spirit and, uh, and for, your, uh, for your participation. Um, Abraham Lincoln may not have been European, but uh, although his, his family did hail from England. But Lincoln was born on this day, the 12th of February, over 200 years ago in 1809. A well-known quote of his provides some advice for us as we embark on the future of Europe dialogue. Be sure to put your feet in the right place and then stand firm. So hopefully today can be part of a journey of us finding the right place to stand. Thanks very much. Mary, thank you very much. And I think, as Mary said, the, uh, the numbers in attendance today really sh do show the level of interest and the interest in that there will be in our, our next speaker, Minister Linkovicius, who has been, as I mentioned earlier, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Lithuania since 2012. He was elected to the Lithuanian Parliament in 1992 and was previously Minister of National Defence on two occasions. The Minister has also served as Head of Lithuania's Mission to the Western European Union and NATO, and served as Lithuania's Permanent Representative to the North Atlantic Council. Yes. Thank you. It's very pleased and honour to be here in this audience in the famous University of Cork, also enjoying your hospitality, and as it was said, it was a big, dele big delegation from Lithuania, from my native city, Kaunas, as deputy mayor, two rectors of two universities, so we are coming and bringing some ideas for future cooperation. This is also future of Europe, our common thinking, what we'd like to have in the future, and also to take stock of where we are. It's a good occasion to think about that, because a lot of now ideas, a lot of uh, proposals uh, for future development of European Union, but it's also not a big secret that we're experiencing a very decisive period. I would say like stress tests of our unity, uh, of our values. Are we ready to protect these values or just to declare? Uh, also, I would say transatlantic u unity is important. Uh, needless to say, why? For, for whatever reasons. Uh, although Ireland is not a light country, but also do care about security, I presume and very active in this field, so very important to have also active participation in this dialogue. So everywhere we have stress tests. And I would uh, add one more for introduction, if you agree, it's also stress tests of our leadership, of leadership of U European leaders. And uh, are we really uh, feel comfortable in uh, doing things and explaining to the public at large what we are doing, making sure that they understand uh, or are we just enlarging this gap between institutions and people, which we're always discussing? That do our people know what European institutions are doing? If asking you, do you know what European Parliament is doing? Do you know the responsibilities? Do you know what institutions are doing? European Commission. Uh, I hope you, you probably know because you're interested in these things, but those people, simple people, that not always sharing these views. And you know, when you have this, so to say, gap or vacuum uh, and also uh, an ability of governments to, to, to engage with the people. Uh, this is caused like lack of leadership and this vacuum filled with something which is not uh, very welcomed by populism, by radicalism. And sometimes people when they are voting during elections or referendums, they're voting guided by emotions. 
not knowledge, not information. So I'm making no particular parallels with Brexit, but also, to say the least, it's not a big secret to you. You know your friends, you, you know your, your probably, uh, maybe, maybe even some relatives living not far away who took very important decision, not only for Britain, but also for whole Europe. And it's not also not a secret when asking what did you do, and not everybody knows, because it was done guided by emotions. In the last period of the campaign, nobody listened to arguments even. Because they said, we have to punish bureaucrats in Brussels, we have to punish European Union, we really should get rid of all these, so to say, hurdles, and that will be fine. Life will come as a future, right future for all of us, and that, that's, that's the case. So this is also an example how this vacuum of leadership and vacuum of information mm. on which based sometimes our decisions which are very important for the future, not only of a particular country, but all the region, can make a difference, which, which is really, really very important. Coming back to the values. You know, I'm coming from the country which uh, in recent history experienced very difficult times. We're celebrating 100 years, quite soon 100 years of our modern statehood, which is a big deal. But half of the century it was Soviet occupation. So it was a big gap as well, break in everything, except of democratic, the diplomatic service was working without break, basically. Because of non-recognition policy, we had our embassy working on permanent in the United States, in D.C., our Lithuanian flag was waving, so <coughs> that, that's symbolically very important to know. But half of the century was stolen from our history, from our life. I'm saying this uh, just because to prove that we really still remember what that means to liberate, what that means to make a revolution, what that means to, to do things and to make reforms even if you do not, uh, if you, even if you're not sure that that will be successful. It was mentioned, and thank you for kind introduction, I really, as ambassador to NATO, I remember in 1999 or even year 2000, uh, during our, so to say, very important period, uh, where we really tried to make sure that we will be members of two very important organizations, NATO and European Union. It was uh, equally important priority of my country, and we were told by future allies, and I was told personally, uh, I even can quote, not saying which country, representative saying that, but said, you, 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 we like you, we like your, your country, it's nice, your freedom fight, but you will never be a member of NATO. And that's 99, or even 2000. And that was really a very good encouragement, as you can imagine, to, to continue with the reforms and, so, <laughs> and to, to also to plan resources adequately, everything. And that, that means we know what that means when you are feeling uh, deserted when you're feeling isolated, when you have a choice, but this choice <coughs> just a good sound, but not protected by your allies, uh, by friends, by like-minded people. And uh, exactly now when we're talking about events in Eastern Ukraine, just to put this example, which is not so far away, because we're talking about Palestine, very important discussions, Israel, talking about Syria, Libya, but it's Europe. It's Europe, it's not so, it's not so far away. And in Europe, we have precedent when some country uh, takes courage or stupidity, whatever we can call, to take part of the territory of sovereign state in 21st century without very, with, with very little consequences. That's my point. Mm -hmm. That's a precedent. And it's not the first time happening. Crimea annexation, it happened in 2014, not so, not so long ago. <laughs> but it was also 2008. It was war in South Caucasus, for those who know history and 20% of another territory of Georgia was annexed at that time. And if you remember, or if not, you can Google, now it's very popular advice. <laughs> <laughs> you really can see what was the reaction of European institutions, of NATO, what were the statements uh, addressing to Russia, uh, what we'd like to wish Russia to do, expect or demand uh, Russia to do, and not a single thing was implemented, that's my point. And in two months, we got back to business as usual because of very pragmatic calls to behave, to be flexible, to be responsible, because we have to trade, we have to have dialogue, which is needless to say, of course, we do, no, no doubt. But at what price? What price we are doing? It was 2008. My country and myself, I was among those who said, what we are doing? We are not consistent. We are not res respecting our own decisions. And we'll, we'll be wrong because sometime we'll have another crisis and we mentioned, I mentioned personally as well, Crimea by the way. Nobody listened, they say you're too sensitive. 
one of my colleagues in Foreign Affairs Council, not saying from which country, said, you're logically saying, uh, you're thinking, uh, you know, I like your re reasoning, but you're too close to the region, you cannot be obje objective, you know, probably you're wrong, you know, basically. It's not so bad, and life is, so to say, continuous, and, you know, well, let's, let's be more relaxed, and that's fine. But after all these disasters, after MH17 shutting down, with some citizens on board, <coughs> after, after, you know, meddling into elections of some countries, after ICE opening exercises, mm -hmm people started to realize that it's not so fine. It really can be repeated. It can, again, something will come up. It's a, this is also, it's, it's also about, of our, about our thinking. While talking about scenarios, models, tax policy, let's not forget foundation on which we are building our building, European Union. This is community of values and principles to be defended, not to, to be retreated. And it's uh, applicable not only for foreign policy or events in Georgia or, or, or Ukraine or, or wherever else. It has to do with our policies on energy, if, you, if I may, may mention. You all, we all know the package. Uh, we, all know, we all know also encouragement to <coughs> diminish, rely, uh, so to say, uh, dependence on single source of supply. We all know our uh, energy uh, union policy and uh, that's, that's right, but we're not implementing that, and this is another example, Nord Stream 2. I don't know whether you're discussing that in Ireland, but in uh, Nordic countries it's discussed. In our region it, it is discussed. It's in odds with our policy, logically not explainable. It was, there were even comments by European Commission, not once and not twice, by those who were responsible, saying that this is illogical. It shouldn't happen. Politically it's the only what you can aim just to punish Ukraine again, let's mention <laughs> Ukraine, because it's just keeping Ukraine from the supply routes, and this is the only uh, political, maybe, reason to do that, which is also not in line with our thinking, but we are doing that at the same time. So this example, again, if we create something, if we invent something else, let's not for, for forget what, what is already agreed, what was already, so to say, adjusted, and not implemented by some reasons. Otherwise, we'll be not so important to discuss further steps. We are not respecting what we did, what we did before, what we did so far. So, uh, uh, it's introductory for 15 minutes, right? So one more block of <laughs> information, <laughs> just and that uh, that will end. Uh, now, when we are thinking about future scenarios, uh, we're always hearing about this multi-speed, right, Europe? Not always, but quite often. And uh, if you agree, we already have many speeds in, in Europe. We have Eurozone, <coughs> where Ireland and Lithuania belongs. We have Schengen Zone, where we belong, but not just us, but somebody not. <laughs> we have military cooperation, we are members of NATO since 2004. Ireland is not, so it's already different speeds, which is not so dramatic, frankly speaking. Uh, it's adjustable, but my point is, if we we'll overplay all this multi-speed thinking, it really could be decentralized uh, vector. It's uh, my opinion. We can argue, we can disagree, but this is really important to note. So I would like to see the process as inclusive as possible, uh, because it's already too much decentralized uh, effect uh, happening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, even if you do not have reasons, people at large, because of this thinking, so to say, without not information, without decent information, taking decisions as it was, as I said, with regard to the Brexit. In my conviction, it was really unnecessary to make that decision if people would be informed. So even that uh, situation uh, says that you <coughs> take decisions sometimes uh, really very, very important, decisive, although uh, grounded on the, on the wrong, wrong arguments. So if you would have reasons, it even even worse, even more difficult. So we should really avoid doing this. And we'd like to see changes, but without opening European treaties, uh, to do that within existing treaties. And as I said, to, to, to do it uh, as, as inclusive as possible, that my country would like to be among those who are doing, not, 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 not doing. Uh, as I said so far, we are trying to belong to all these consolidated segments which you already have. But another, so whatever other option also, also is possible. Uh, now we are very, again, important uh, discussions on Brexit. Uh, not very successful, to say, Frank. It's very difficult to go in, very difficult. As a one part of that, it's also uh, Irish issue, so to say, and not only border management, but also 
Good Friday Agreement and the faith of that. We all, all wish our be the best to our friends. I talked to my colleague minister on the phone. He's in good mood, so let's hope it will be okay, uh, his, his meetings to, to tonight. But, but this is, again, specificity. It's peculiarity because of the history and needless to say why. So it should stay like peculiarity, like, like something which is exceptional because of the history of Ireland, because of the relations with the United Kingdom. So that will stay. But as a rule, we should be as inclusive as possible. We should really try to stick together when it's possible to perform together things. Uh, we can be more specific if discussion will, will develop. So that would be introductory comments for the beginning. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much for those, I think what you'll agree were really fascinating insights, um, I think, and really give us food for thought for our question session later, uh, even in terms of what the Minister described as the decentralised thinking, and I was quite intrigued by this idea of us stress testing various uh, European leaders, so you'd get quite a, quite a variation in, uh, in your results there. So we're going to move on now uh, to uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Minister David Stanton, who is Minister of State at the Department of Justice with special responsibility for equality, immigration and integration. Uh, immediately prior to that, or most recently, um, Minister Stanton had a very successful uh, tenure as chair of the Oireachtas Committee on Justice, Defence and, uh, and Equality. It's not always the easiest thing to shine as, uh, as the chair of an Oireachtas Committee, but uh, he managed to do just that. Um, Minister Stanton was first elected to Dáil Éireann in 1997. Thank you very much for that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. I know, yeah. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, Minister, you're very welcome. Distinguished guest, Senator Kelleher is here as well, from, uh, and ambassadors, and uh, of course, John O'Halloran here from, from UCC, uh, Vice President. It's a great pleasure, Minister, to welcome you to Cork today. I know you had a, a ramble around our lovely city. Not all, some part of it. Some part of it. You've got to come back then to see the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. And it's great to be able to share the stage with, with you today at this event. Really good. Um, Ireland and, and Lithuania may be small countries at the opposite ends of a continent, but what lies between us brings us closer than we have ever been. Our shared membership of the European Union means that we connect across a vast range of areas, economic, social, cultural, and political, in ways that we never did before. And I will come back to examine how we see those shared connections developing in the future very soon. I understand you, sh you do St. Patrick's Day in Lithuania as well. Yes. And the rivers turn green. Yes. Excellent. And faces as well. And what? Faces as well. And faces too. Excellent. Good, good, good. Perhaps the most uh, visible way in which we today are connected, however, is through the large Lithuanian community who make their home here, whether permanent or temporary. And they represent a human connection which, which can only bring us closer together and increase our mutual understanding. Because in Ireland we know what it means to have significant immigration, the very human pain it causes, but it also provides opportunities, opens up new horizons, a new connection. And I want to assure you, Minister, that we value the contribution that your country men and country women are making in Ireland <coughs> to our economy and to our society. And we hope that they feel welcome here. Indeed, we share an interest in finding ways to maintain connections with our respective diasporas. And I am very pleased to see that our ministries have been active in exchanging experience in this regard. This sharing of knowledge is valuable for both of us. And we will be happy to continue to share our experience and to learn from viewers in the coming years. And as you know, we have a very large global diaspora. And we, we are building those connections now with uh, my, my colleague, Minister Cannon, doing a lot of work in that area. Because we value our diaspora as you value your diaspora as well. Now, before I look forward to our common future in the European Union, I would briefly like to look back. It is a matter of pride to us in this year, which ma marks the 100th anniversary of Lithuania's re-emergence as an independent state that Ireland never recognised the Soviet occupation of Lithuania or of the other Baltic states. Uh, here in Ireland, we are halfway through a decade of commemorations, during which we remember the significant events of our own independence struggle. We wish you well, therefore, in your celebrations. Although I have described Lithuania as a small country, there was, of course, a moment in the 14th century 
when the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was the largest country in Europe. This should perhaps serve as a reminder of the big ambitions small countries can have for our shared continent. The Department of Foreign Affairs is working closely with the Institute of International and European Affairs and the European Movement in Ireland on the future of Europe agenda. The government sees this debate as an opportunity rather than a challenge and on their behalf want to acknowledge today the cooperation of both IIEA and EMI. Decisions we take today will have far-reaching consequences for the future, so it is vital that we have the benefit of the in-depth analysis that forms the basis for sound engagement with our own people. Indeed, later this month, my colleague Helen McEntee, TD, the Minister for State for European Affairs, will be hosting a citizens' dialogue on the future of Europe in Cork uh, County Hall. She and the Tánaiste are keen to get your views on the type of Europe you want in 5, 10 or 20 years' time. And our slogan says, it's your future, your Europe, so get involved. We do not want to preempt the debate that is already underway, but the Europe we want is one where small countries like Ireland and the Republic of Lithuania are respected for their contributions and encouraged to fulfil their ambitions, even their big ambitions. In this debate, we have no choice but to think big. And the, as the Taoiseach said last month in the European Parliament, we must focus on the big new challenges facing Europe and its citizens. When it comes to big issues such as migration, climate change, and the asymmetric threats such as cyber security, what is the point of 28 member states coming up with 28 different solutions? If Brexit, much and all as we regret it, has served one useful purpose, it is to remind us that we are better together. Minister, Cork is the home of the Tyndall Institute, a leading European research centre. The centre is a research flagship of this university, UCC, and employs over 500 researchers, in engineers and support staff. It is named after John Tyndall, a 19th century scientist who became renowned for popularising science. Indeed, we could say he was a popularist rather than a populist. He is best remembered for working out why the sky is blue, and today the colour of the sky is known as Tyndall Blue. One, <laughs> when we come to the debate on the future of Europe, we should have a healthy mix of pragmatism and blue skies thinking. I say pragmatism because what we need most are initiatives that connect with the citizens and make a real difference to their day-to-day -day lives. But we also need blue skies thinking. When I say blue skies thinking, I do not mean pie-in-the-sky thinking because the effort we make on research and innovation today is vital and will reap real dividends in the future. It is a truism to say that we are living in a changing world. In fact, the pace of change, which is already disconcerting, is only going to get faster. Children starting out in school today in Cork or Quans are likely to start their working lives in jobs that do not exist yet. Half of the jobs we have today will be automated in the coming years. Decisions we now take will help our children get ready for those changes. In fact, the best thing we can teach them now is how to cope with change because they are going to have plenty of it. I am pleased to say that the European Union has been very helpful to Ireland in terms of support for research and innovation. Here in Cork, a local company, Clean Grow, is looking at the feasibility of growing crops in space and examining whether this might provide astronauts with long-term supplies of food and oxygen. And there's a car up there, as we know, since last week as well, ready for people going around there. UCCC is a partner in a 3.3 million project, already funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme, which is looking at the chemical makeup of our oceans. This is the sort of research which will give European countries the edge, which will allow us to keep one step ahead of the competition in the new globalised economy. I understand that Ireland and the Baltic states, uh, including Lithuania, are part of a like-minded group working together to ensure the completion of the digital single market by the end of this year. Like Lithuania, we also believe in investing in energy transition to allow us to the challenge uh, of climate change and to turn that into an opportunity to transform our day-to-day -day lives. Post-Brexit, we in Ireland are keen to deepen the friendship we enjoy with our European partners, and I want to assure you that one of our strongest alliances is with the Nordic-Baltic group with whom we have so much in common, not least our commitment to the completion of the internal market, especially the market in services. 
Equally, it is in our, our own interest, as much as in Lithuania's interest, to develop closer relations with the countries of the Eastern Partnership. It must be a priority for Europe to work with our friends and neighbours in the East to develop stronger, diversified and vibrant economies across the region. Likewise, we have a real opportunity in May at the Western Balkan Summit to put renewed vigour into our strategy for that region and to pay more than lip service to the European perspective of the countries of the Western Balkans. Closer research uh, and innovation need investment and resources and this will have to be devoted to bring peace and stability to Europe's neighbourhood. There will be some of the new demands put on the EU's budget where, where negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework begin in earnest. But a balance will need to be drawn between new demands and tra tra traditional policies. And with that in mind, it is a source of great consol cons consolation to know that Ireland and Lithuania will be at one in ensuring the common agricultural policy and cohesion funding are adequately resourced. Very important for us here and for you as well, Minister. Ireland and Lithuania joined PESCO, our permanent structured cooperation together at the end of last year. Lithuania is a member of NATO, and as you reminded us earlier on, Ireland is not. But what we have both have in common is a shared commitment to undertaking international peace support missions to prevent and resolve conflict in support of the United Nations. Membership of PESCO is voluntary. It provides a mechanism to meet an identified need for closer cooperation between partners to ensure the availability of the military capabilities required for these purposes and to ensure that our personnel serving on future EU missions will be well prepared and as well equipped as they should be. This is the sort of solidarity the European Union of the future will depend on. With this type of solidarity, we are better placed to try and shape the new competitive, multipolar and globalised world of the future without waiting for the rest of the world to shape us. Ireland greatly appreciated the solidarity shown by Lithuania and all our European partners during phase one of the Brexit negotiations. And we know we can count on your support in phase two as well. We hope to see the first draft of the withdrawal agreement later this month and we expect additional guidelines on the future of the future relation on the framework sorry for the future relationship between the European Union and the UK to be presented at the March European Council these negotiations will continue to move at a rapid pace and the government is fully prepared to ensure the best interests of the people of this on this island are fully represented and protected as the process continues the future of the EU27 will be about forging partnerships and your visit here today, Minister, sends a very welcome signal about the strength and depth of the relationship between Ireland and the Republic of Lithuania. Because in unity there is strength. Or as we say in the Irish language, ni la, ni nat le, le cor le kela. It is my pleasure to be here with you today, Minister. Uh, I know Simon Coveney, my colleague, can't be here. He sends his regards to you. I know you spoke earlier with him. He's looking forward to meeting you, I think, uh, later in the week in, in Dublin. Tomorrow morning. Yeah. Tomorrow morning. Yeah. So thanks for being here. Thank you very much indeed. Minister Stanton, thank you very much for that really interesting speech, which I think, as I said earlier, also gives us uh, plenty of material to be getting on with. Now, I think just to do things slightly differently, I might ask the people who are really here to listen to this morning, might ask each of you just to say your name and what you're studying to give us a sense of, uh, of where you're coming from and then we'll, we'll get into the questions. So uh, hi, uh, my name is Rob Byrne, I'm a Master's Student of International Public Policy and Diplomacy. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Gason and I'm a first year student of government. My name is Lee Nagel and I'm doing government as well. My name is Patrick O'Keefe and I'm in fourth year government. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> we, might, we might finally get the correct pronunciation. Uh, if you, I'm going to start with uh, Lee with you and I'm going to ask you um, in terms of your studies and you were telling me earlier that you had spent some time in, uh, in Brussels um, which I'm sure gave you a really, a really good insight into being at the, the heart of the EU that what positive or negative impact um, do you think that the EU has had on, on your life? Um, do you mind if I ask how old you are? I'm 26. 26, yeah. okay. So in your, your 26 years, what, what impact do you think the EU has had on you? Um, well, like a lot of people my age, I suppose we can say we have available travel, you know, you can go pretty freely to different countries, um, work as well, and obviously this was a big thing for me last year, being able to just arrive in Belgium 
Um, <coughs> and uh, we were only staying for uh, three months, so there was no need to, to kind of declare yourself or go through a whole lot of paperwork. Mm-hmm. There was the little few bits for college and stuff, but um, it was just the ease of that is is huge. Um, as well, like I've got family who live in uh, Europe, my brothers in the Netherlands, and being able to again get on a train and just go straight from Belgium to the Netherlands, nobody stops, you know, nobody checks your bags, nobody, yeah. you know, there's no customs, nothing like that. So that is all very beneficial. Um, and I suppose even the leisure aspect of it as well, being able to just to go on holiday is nice. Um, on the other side of that, I suppose there are people maybe who can't avail of these things as easily or as readily as some of us can. It's sitting in this room, you know, we're in university and we're encouraged to go away and we're encouraged to explore. Mm-hmm. And maybe I can understand why some people feel attacked from that. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of just a little Great, bit. Thank you. Rob, if you might pick that up if you, if uh, you would. Yeah, I mean, from a personal level for me, uh, being a European, being a member of the EU has been absolutely wonderful. Um, back two years ago, or three years ago now, uh, I just went off, I moved to Croatia for a little bit, and uh, I worked and lived in Croatia for a little bit, and after that I worked and lived in Slovenia for a little bit, and after that I worked and lived in Italy for a little bit, and after that I worked and lived in Austria for a little bit, and in Germany for a little bit, and in the Czech Republic for a little bit, and in Hungary for a little bit, and all of this came uh, absolutely no problem, I was crossing borders, there was no issues, there was nothing, so from a personal level for me, the ability to work and travel freely has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, now, I never availed with myself, but when I was doing my undergraduate, I had many friends who did the Erasmus program where they took a year out to study, which was absolutely wonderful and beneficial to them as well. Uh, so, to answer the question from a personal level, it's the ability to travel and work uh, with absolutely no barriers, except language maybe, because I would never be able to speak Hungarian. But um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, uh, just the ability to travel and work uh, across a huge continent, which has such different history. You know, every country has its own history and its own unique past. Uh, like I said, language, but the ability to travel with absolutely no restriction or minimum restriction uh, is something that we really have to value greatly looking forward to going to the EU, or okay. staying in the EU, I should say. Thanks, Rob. You might just pass the mic on there to, to Danielle. What, what has your experience been, Danielle? Yeah, so for me, I suppose I'm only 19, so I haven't had the opportunities for Erasmus like everyone else has had so far. But um, I have had an opportunity to do a bilateral exchange with the Association of Active Youths in Greece. So that was a brilliant opportunity to experience a whole new culture um, with young people in Greece. We travelled for a week and then they subsequently came back. But I've also been lucky enough to be asked to speak at the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly multiple times over the last few years. And all of this has been thanks to Erasmus funding. So none of it, there was no problem with uh, funding for anything. It was all ready to go for us. And we just got to go and represent the voice of young people uh, throughout the Brexit process was the main key issue at that time. So it's been brilliant to be able to do this and I know in the future when I get to my third year in government I'll be able to do Erasmus as well. I'm curious to ask you there then, um, without having you as a spokesperson for all young people, but your involvement in, in, in Brexit, you know, was there a sort of a, a general feeling amongst you, yourself and your, and your colleagues and friends regarding Brexit or was there diversity of, of views? Um, well, for the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, um, I was representing Youth Work Ireland and we worked alongside with Youth Action Northern Ireland, Youth Scotland, Youth Cymru and Wales and right. UK Youth. So there was a mixed feel because some pe- we had some people who uh, voted to remain, some people who voted to leave, and then we had ourselves, the Irish representatives, who didn't vote at all. So it was very mixed views. But we why, didn't, why didn't you vote? We can't. Oh, you, oh sh- sorry, I thought, I, thought, <laughs> I, I thought in this particular forum that everybody got it. I see, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Stupid question. I, at least somebody's got one out of the way. Uh, we were lucky enough that throughout the youth yeah. facilitation yeah, yeah. we were able to come to mutual agreements as to what we want to achieve on mm. various topics out of Brexit. Yeah. So it was a brilliant opportunity to represent young people on a Brexit forum. Okay, thank you for that. Patrick, in, in asking you this question, I'm also curious as to, again, put it in terms of pitching it, that you know the opportunity of being in a university and that there are people of a certain age, that the sentiment towards, you know, towards EU membership uh, that, that, you'd pick, that you'd have yourself and that you'd pick up amongst, amongst friends and um, people in your year and that. 
And um, uh, me personally, anyway, I yeah, yeah, I yeah, I'm always feel a strong kind of union towards Europe. Uh, consider myself very European. I was kind of like Rob as well. I spent a lot of time away, um, and I just even getting a PPS number. I went to Spain, and I arrived in Malaga, and I had my PPS number probably two hours later. Yeah. When I went to Finland, it was literally five minutes. It was going into mm. an office, getting it, and just mm. the ease of everything. Um, amongst my friends, they would consider themselves quite European as well. Yeah. I think in Ireland, it was, I spent some time in Brussels as well, and if you're talking to young people in Brussels, they're European first. They wouldn't call themselves uh, Belgium or thing, they would say I'm European. You I think wouldn't, do you think you'd get that, you'd get that here? I was just about to say, like, yeah. even myself, I'm a very proud Irish man as well, mm -hmm. so I think if someone asked me, I would definitely say Irish first, but European would be an extremely close second. Um, I would consider myself European, but... In Brussels, obviously, it is very mm. European. Based. And you're at the heart of it. You're at the heart of it, mm. so of course, they all say that they're European, but um, no, I definitely consider myself European as well, but strong Irish man as well, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Lee, I'm going to move on now to ask you about uh, development policy, which is a key component of Ireland's foreign policy, and how best can Ireland promote prosperity and security through, through the EU? Um, so I was looking into this a little bit and the question itself is quite like there's a load of different little buzzwords in it so um i kind of try to just break it down a small bit for myself and not spend too long going into too much mm. detail but um as a country ireland contributes quite a lot to foreign aid development aid um and there was recently more um, given in the budget last year towards it. Um, I think the principle of foreign aid is definitely a good thing. Um, and there has been a lot of su successes. There was, um, with the Millennium Development Goals, we did reach a, quite a yeah. few of them, you know, to a great extent, and there is a lot of room for improvement. And since then, we have had a chance to reflect and kind of come up with new ones of the scale of development goals. Um, I think as a foreign policy measure, Development is a very good one um, because it kind of promotes, like the question says, it promotes develop, uh, sustainability and it promotes prosperity. Um, what I will say is the word security in there did throw me a bit yeah, because yeah. like when you think of security, it's not the same as prosperity. Well, in my, my yeah. view, security and prosperity, security kind of has that negative connotation to a lot of people, well, Irish people anyway, you kind of go, Oh God, no European army can't talk about that, can't think about that. Um, and that is one thing I was nervous about talking talking about today. Um, so I'm kind of going to skip over the huge part of, of, of getting into that nitty gritty. But um, do you? Can I ask you briefly? Do yeah. you have a sort of an instinctive gut feeling on the security thing, though, that it's a good <coughs> or a bad idea for Ireland to get more involved? Mm. Is it something that would worry you? Well, interestingly enough, I, uh, th th this is kind of going off top of mm. my um, my point, but okay. I was talking to my friends last night. We were in a WhatsApp group, and I just said, "Oh my God, I've got this thing tomorrow." Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they text back, and I would say that there was five of us in the group, and two remained silent, and then two replied, and their replies were totally different. And we went to the same school. We are all college mm. educated, yeah. and one of them was totally like, I love Europe, Erasmus, or Erasmus, you know, this, that, and the other. And the other one was like, no, migrants, Brexit, uh, e like, EU army. EU army yeah. like, and my problem is that I sit in the fence and I say, ah, I see what you're saying and I can see what you're saying and I can't make up my mind. And my one of my pals, who was very pro-Europe, said, if somebody invaded Ireland tomorrow, you know, we'd have Europe on our side and they mm. couldn't kick their ass or whatever. Yeah. Like, and I, I, you know, I get that and I suppose there is a security, but if you don't, on the other side, a relationship has to be symbiotic and it has to be mutually beneficial. Yeah. So if you're not putting in, you can't really yeah. take back. So and this, this gets to the heart of a, of a question I wanted to put uh, to yourself, Minister, in terms of, there, I think, I don't think it's overstretching it to say, that there would be very different attitudes in Lithuania compared to among Irish c citizens 
in terms of security, and as you highlighted yourself in your speech, in, in, from your point of view, very much to do with, I suppose, a, a, a feeling under threat, or even under, under physical threat, which is not something that we, we feel here, and we're more, you know, we have, a, we, we have the luxury, if you like, of being able to um, give more thought to it, and as opposed to bringing, bringing fear to the equation. No, a lot I can say, but uh, first uh, coming to my mind that when we're talking about this uh, nice life, traveling, talking uh, with the people, no borders, no, no sort of restrictions, it's fine, but this is also something we achieve together in the European Union. It's our asset, and it should be defended, but this is not given, that's my point. Very important. And if you, you think that something, as you said, we are more exposed to some, uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe dangerous, <laughs> Um, maybe it's true, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we all are exposed. Uh, when I try to say that there's a precedent of something wrong happening, even if it's far away from, from Cork, it uh, doesn't mean it's not reality. And doesn't mean that cannot be precedent. And this has to do with the mindset, not only the physical activity or, or mm -hmm. some, some events. It has to do with the resilience. Mm. Uh, especially nowadays, when we're talking about threats, we are not talking necessarily about these conventional threats, you know tanks, uh, missiles, uh, it's also important, but we're talking about hybrid threats, which are uh, here and now, even if you're not noticing them. Do Cyber you threats, yes. energy, energy blackmailing, uh, information or propaganda, or as I say, uh, brainwashing. Brainwashing effect is very huge, because uh, our friends in the East, uh, they're spending billions of uh, euros or dollars, whatever you can count for that activity and doing that very systematically and mm. uh, focused and with some success, I would say, and a uh, very smart way. And uh, this is not applicable only to Eastern Europe, if somebody thinks, it's also applicable to Western Europe. And uh, through the channels like Russia Today, or I'm calling sometimes Russia Yesterday or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, no, but this, is, this is, has some effect, you know. And brainwa after brainwashing, you're really demotivating people. You make them more lazy, less, less so to say, principled, mm -hmm. uh, while voting in their own par parliaments or governments or whatever. And this is really effect. So it's illusion that uh, we still have this uh, zone of comfort. It's over, and there are many examples. I, you know, I, even you can notice the terminology. Some countries, uh, let's not mention Ireland, let's say Sweden, some time ago Sweden was neutral, uh, then it was non-aligned. Uh, you cannot say it's neutral because uh, Sweden is very active. And, and very active, by the way, in the security and the operations and peace operations under, by the way, in the Na Na NATO aegis in including, mm -hmm. although not members of NATO. Mm -hmm. So I can really endlessly talk about that, but my, my point is that it's not just we are exposed. Maybe we feel that better. We still remember that. Mm. Maybe we have the exercises in the vicinity of our borders. Certainly more recent, uh, yeah. Zapat exercises, uh, very close, uh, mm. 30 kilometers from <coughs> our capital. Of course you can feel that. Sometimes even, even you can hear that. Yeah. So <laughs> well, this, that is, this is really the very, case. Thank you very much, Minister. That picks up on a, on a question, Danny, that I wanted to ask you about the role the EU should play in tackling disinformation in member states and even in the candidate countries uh, for, for accession. Yeah, so in my own opinion, this can be a very dangerous question because while the EU may be able to decide what is and isn't disinformation, they can't just go and censor it, in my own opinion. It's, up, it's the responsibility of journalists and uh, publication, media publications to ensure that they're adhering to high journalistic standards. Mm. So if the EU gets involved in censoring this, then it can lead to a lot of problems and maybe even increase your scepticism. Um, but for example, as well, in countries coming into the EU and countries already here, education is a key part to this and the EU should be trying to ensure that every member country and country for accession um, has a strong EU section of their curriculums. Mm -hmm. And the key part of this then is that young people will be educated with the facts and then it's up to them to decide what they choose is accurate information or disinformation because it is people's own opinions mm. at that stage. But say then take that for example, one of our own lecturers today, Emmanuel, Dr. Emmanuel Shankrinlovin, is out teaching a group of primary school children mm. about the European Union. So it's starting them from a young age, learning about the key aspects of the EU, what's involved in being a member of the EU, 
and that in the future then when they hear something they can decide well I learned when I was 12 that this is accurate information so I think that's the key part of uh, and can, can I ask you, is there something that the, the minister spoke about in terms of active disinformation? As he said, in this instance, coming from the East, we've all read about it in terms of the US election and the ramifications of that, and even in terms of um, Brexit and that. Again, to ask you, the level of sort of knowledge, I mean, it's people your age that are the, who, you know, the, the digital natives. Um, how much awareness there is of what, that what you're reading where, excuse me, you're checking the source that, you know, verifying it, that you know it's, it's sound information. I think a key part of it is <coughs> it's all online, it's all Twitter, Facebook, mm. it's all links to whatever papers, Irish papers, international papers, and there is an assumption that it's going to be accurate information, that it's not biased, but we know that this isn't true. Journal like every person, a journalist will have their own opinions, and it's very easy for this to play into the articles that they write and that they publish. Mm -hmm. So while everyone may have the knowledge that they're reading, no one really is aware how accurate this information is because different people will have different biases. You're reading various articles about the same topic in one day from different papers and you're getting very different views. But I suppose the thing is that, I, I can hear it anyway, and it's, it's inherent in your answer, that you're aware now that this is an issue, mm -hmm. maybe yeah, much more so. so. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Patrick a question now, and I think I might come to Minister Stanton on it afterwards. Patrick, what role the EU should play in relation to taxation, which is a particularly, uh, you probably know this already, uh, Minister, uh, because an, inter taxes, an interesting know. question in <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's a very interesting question in Ireland. Um, the new commission proposal, the uh, Common Corporate Tax Base, um, it's basically to harmonise the tax base within the EU. I actually think for Ireland it would be a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it, our corporate tax rate, as we all know, is 12.5%, and I'm quite happy with that, to be honest, as an Irish person. But we're kind of... Um, we're getting into the realm from other European states has been almost known and almost mocked as a tax haven and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I actually think this CCCTB could actually f rectify that. Yeah. It's not changing our corporate tax base from 12.5%, it's going to stay the same. It basically means that our effective tax rate will be hopefully getting closer to 12.5% from the uh, multinational companies instead of in some cases, 1% mm -hmm. or 3%. And yeah, no, I think it's a brilliant idea. And I think it's something that we need to be, if we want to kind of harmonize Europe and if we want mm -hmm. to be involved and if we want to be sitting down at the table, I think this is a good step. And how do you stage. view, or how do you think our reputation mm -hmm. is viewed on, uh, on these taxation issues? Um, over in Brussels, just even pub talk, mm -hmm. it's not viewed that well to be honest and yeah. um, even my boss my boss was French and I know the French are so good at it either but he was quite um he was quite adamant that you know he was the whole apple thing was coming mm -hmm. up as well during the summer so mm -hmm. it was it was hot topic mm -hmm. over in Brussels and not in a good way for art I have to say so I, I think this is a good step to kind of move on from that kind of get our respect back in certain areas and make a bit more money as well. Thank you Patrick. So Minister, hot topic, how, uh -huh. do, we, uh, how do we move on and uh, repair our reputation in this, uh, this area? Yeah, well we're a very small country on the edge of Europe as an island nation and we have a lot of disadvantages. For instance at the moment getting goods in and out of Ireland is, is difficult, it's expensive. Um, now we, we have to be competitive and obviously we live in a very competitive world. Our uh, competitors out there are, are using this as a, a stick to beat us with. Mm -hmm. But it's been very successful for us. In actual fact, many countries are lowering their tax now. Uh, you know, it's happening in the States as well, for instance. They're actually lowering their corporation tax rates. So I think that we have to be very vigilant here, that we don't actually end up in a situation where uh, we are forced it into a, a place where we're not competitive. And that people are using uh, the reputation kind of uh, stick to beat us with as well. Um, the, the taxation is, an, is a national issue, uh, and it remains so. 
Um, but this, this new debate that's happening here was something we were watching very carefully and engaged with. But we have to be very, very vigilant as well because we have a lot of disadvantages in Ireland. Mm -hmm. We actually brought forward the 12.5% in its work for us, along with other things as well. I mean, our education here is quite good. Here in UCC is an example of that. We have a very young workforce, we have a very hard work workforce, hard working workforce. And um, but and we're English speaking and we'll probably be the only English speaking country in the Eurozone that Brexit goes ahead, which is an advantage. But our island status is a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to be very careful of that. And I listen carefully what the minister said about security, cyber security and other types of security. And uh, the minister you know, he's on he's on the edge there. And uh, you know, certainly where 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 the digital agency is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know we're not, we're in the center as well, so yeah. you know it, it's 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 a it's a changing world all the time. But I wouldn't be rushing into any major changes for the tax Well, I guess if we if we had more time uh, on this particular issue, Patrick, give you a good run for your money <laughs> on, on that. But I'm going to move on to a different. This is the final question um, from from the panel, and then we'll move on uh, to to a question from the floor. <coughs> and it's moving to a slightly different area. Uh, and Rob, it's to ask you that would you support a path for membership of the EU to countries in the Western Balkans? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think the EU should always be seeking to expand um, within reason. Um, the Western Balkans is a very interesting area of Europe. Uh, as I briefly mentioned, I was there for some time. Um, if you think about it, across Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary and Greece, uh, the Western Balkans is surrounded by members of the EU, and it should only make sense that they should one day join us. Um, so the question being, do I think they should join? Do I think they sh there should be a pathway? Uh, yes. I wouldn't be too confident that they would be ready to join immediately. There are what, some what would be the what would be the issues? Uh, what struck you when you were there, or what you've read? Um, well, yeah, there's. I mean, you're looking at the Western Balkans as an area that just over 20 years ago was absolutely ravaged. It was um, one of the biggest conflicts. It's, it's certainly been the biggest conflict in the European mainland since World War II. Um, I have made friends there, and there are still tensions there between the countries. There are still bilateral issues. I mean, even if you look at Kosovo. Uh, the EU27 doesn't uh, uniformly recognise Kosovo, but Ireland and Lithuania have since 2008. Uh, there are some nations which still don't recognise that, which obviously would be a massive issue. Um, but I think the idea of getting the Western Balkans into the EU would be great. It would be a huge ideological victory. Uh, the EU itself was born uh, you know, from the aftermath of World War II. So to get these members, to get these countries on board, the former Yugoslavia, uh, would be a great success of the EU. If we could see Serbia and Croatia be members once again, um, it, would be, it would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, to get all members in, you would have, I suppose you'd have Bosnia as well, which would be um, the first EU nation to have a really strong, uh, I suppose, numerous uh, indigenous Islamic population, which would also um, contribute to the diversity that we celebrate in the European Union too. And so from an ideological point of view, I think it, it would be an absolutely wonderful success. Mm -hmm. However, there are challenges that do need to be overcome. Um, I remember in Juncker's address last year, he stated that there would be no more enlargement in this tenure, uh, which I would have considered quite demotivating for these countries. Uh, however, as the minister said earlier, uh, was it 15 years ago when Lithuanians were told that they would not be members of NATO, all that did was motivate them further to really abide um, by the rules and really get the regulations in place. Uh, and I would hope that would happen for the Western Balkans as well, uh, once they... Um, get all these regulations be a key in, uh, it would be great. Um, so yes, okay. I put fully supported, however, I think there are a few stumbling blocks okay. and hurdles that are needed. Thanks, yeah. Rob. No. Thank you very much. Um, now we've heard, I think you'll agree, some really interesting points from the panel, and whether you, it's something you want to pick up on that the panel <coughs> mentioned, or a whole new area. Um, if you wouldn't mind just identifying yourself, you put up your hand identifying yourself. If there's somebody specific you want to address the question to, or, or you can keep it more generally, whichever you prefer. I saw just this gentleman here, I think, was the, yeah. um, the first to indicate. There's a microphone just behind you there. Uh, John Ryan is my name. Uh, Hiya, John. The, the question I have is uh, regarding free trade. Um, given that Ireland and Lithuania are two chairs around the European 27 in, in the Council of Europe, and uh, given that we now know that the uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, is in the deep freeze, um, is, do you think that Europe um, should consider other methodologies or a separate plan uh, to promote both free trade and fair trade? Or, as I fear, that they're too much putting their eggs in the one basket, hoping that they can patch together TTIP at a later stage with sticking plaster and glue uh, and somehow get it across the line later. Thank you. 
Okay, very interesting question. Anybody, any of you that... Uh, we have to react. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Minister. It's really not a good time for free trade, uh, especially with the United States, but I do not think it's forever. Uh, and maybe other issues also discussed, as you know, also not very good time, but I, be I believe time will come. We are a trade nation. We, Lithuania, same as we, Ireland, uh, most bulk, bulk of our GDP uh, gets from, from, so to say, our trade. And we are really free trade. We in favor uh, for whatever direction comes. And when talking about transatlantic trade, we are also now in the process of rectifying uh, treaty with Canada. For instance, it's also very important. So this is not over, and that will come. Uh, what we have to do, uh, really, to find more arguments, because in my view, it's again has to do with the leadership and ownership. <coughs> frankly, when sometimes uh, uh, info mis disinformation is spread, uh, not backed by by arguments, mm -hmm. but people think that this is wrong. But when it comes to the substance, when trying to ask concrete questions, what do you think it's wrong? Quality of food? What do you think is wrong? Uh, no barriers, uh, protectionism, what you have in mind. And we're addressing these issues, it seems uh, artificial. But it's too late because uh, the uh, conviction is already here and very difficult to remedy after mm -hmm. that. Uh, very difficult, expensive, sometimes even arguments not working. So we have to change our uh, tactics and to I explain before doing things and to be proactive in, 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 in providing arguments. Mm -hmm. and people, should be, people deserve to get information, frankly speaking. While well, politicians dis discussing and deciding some things and then angry that people do not understand, that's because they're not engaged duly in, in due time. So that's the point. So, so should be some lessons drawn. But I shouldn't say that we should change something or, or, or invent something. We have to come to that anyway. It's unavoidable. If, if, you, if you talk to business people in, in the United States, some of them, let's say not all, maybe some of them still believe that this is also not over. It's not, not that thing. And time is not, not easy now, but not forever. Okay, thank you. I suppose that gets back to the, what you were saying in your speech about vac va vacuums being, yes, being allowed it's, it's to develop. It's passive, yeah. passive, so to yeah. say. Uh, we have Senator Colette Kelleher uh, in the, in the yeah. audience. Um, Senator thank Kelleher. You and congratulations to um, UCC and the IIEA for organizing this. And the title is Forging Partnerships. Um, and uh, I'm a convener. Uh, of the Ireland uh, Lithuania Friendship Group on behalf of the Count Corla. So um, I've been working with my colleague here, the ambassador. We're about to launch um, and very open to ideas and suggestions on how we carry on the conversation from today. So, Minister, if you've got any ideas or suggestions, uh, either Minister or indeed the panel or the audience, I'm very open to hearing those uh, as we embark on continuing the conversation between Ireland and, and Lithuania through the Friendship Group. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Kelleher. Any, yeah, just there. Gentleman there. This microphone just beside you there. Madam Moderator and Minister Lequicius, good afternoon. Um, Minister Staunton has already alluded to the size of Lithuania in the past, but he hasn't actually quite covered what the area was. It actually uh, covered an area from the Baltic to the Black Sea, an area of some 800,000 square kilometers compared to its present day 65,000 kilometers, quite small, a bit, like, a bit smaller than Ireland. Um, at the present time, you have a northern neighbor, Latvia, uh, you have Poland, Belarus, you have the Russian Federation in the form of Kaliningrad um, Oblast, and then you have the Baltic Sea. Do you at times think that Lithuania is actually holding a tiger by the tank in its relationship, by the tail in its relationship with the Russian Federation? Good question. Well, thank you for excellent knowledge of our region. You have mentioned all neighbors, and you're quite right. It's indeed impressive. And uh, actually, we also looking at these old maps with no nostalgia, but I'm, of course, not serious. <laughs> now we're in a different situation. And uh, neighbors are, all, all neighbors are important, uh, although they are quite different. Uh, with regard to the Russian Federation, it's really specific because it's enclave, you know, it's separated territory, so it's not mainland of Russia. And uh, traditionally, I can tell you, it was always, I'm always saying it's not a problem, it's a challenge, because we had very good relations, usually with Kaliningrad region. Uh, 
because they need us uh, as a trade partners. Uh, our food products were very popular uh, after embargo was introduced by both sides. Because Euro European Union with sanctions against Russia, Russians ag against, uh, against European Union, and neighbors, of course, suffered uh, the most. And we are in particular, by the way, with regard to the food, production, transport sector, this is also not a big secret. But our food products were very popular in Kaliningrad. Russians invented, uh, invented terminology, uh, replacement of import or something mm -hmm. like that, and Russian, Russians th themselves were, uh, so to say, kidding about this terminology, because terminology was invented, but uh, products were not invented, because shelves were em empty at the end of the day, and the consumers suffered, uh, basically, a lot. So this is also kind of litmus test of not just Lithuanian relations with Russian Federation, keeping the tail or whatever you can call it, but also, also in general. And we feel uh, responsible and sometimes we re really feel it's our duty to tell to our partners uh, because we know that country and we, we know these people. And that doesn't mean that we do not respect. We do respect these people. Russians are decent people. They're getting clear messages. They, they really from time of the, no, half a century ago, they claim mm -hmm. taking clear messages. It's, if message is not clear, uh, it's taken like provocation sometimes. This is not understandable by somebody, uh, but this is true, believe me. If you're behaving, if you're be being flexible, if you're retreating, it doesn't mean that the other side will do the same. It's why vice versa. This is the main main philosophy. And sometimes when you say, don't be pro provocative, don't make harsh statements, or don't act something, well, I would say it's provocative not, not acting. It's provocative not making statement when it's necessary to make. This is the case. And we're experiencing uh, through, through our relations and, and the in the neighborhood. You know, uh, paradoxically, we, re we, we have restrictions in the political level relations. We are not queuing to Kremlin to meet leader leaders. But practical level of cooperation taking place. Last year, our export increased to Russia 27%, the areas which are not covered by, by sanctions. There's cross-border cooperation in the context of European Union the regions, you know, neighborhood regions. It's taking place. Tourists, increasing number of tourists coming for, from, from Russia, despite propaganda about us in Russian media. People do not trust they are coming. This is also also kind of uh, experience we can share with others. But they are taking clear messages. And if we will be not smart <coughs> enough to, to not to be consistent with our policies in the future, they will use that in the proper way, as I said, adequately. Feeling weakness, feeling that uh, it's possible to do something uh, wrong with a little price, and this is again again the, the, the point. So okay. we, we really feel quite uh, interesting uh, geopolitical position. Quite, uh, well, it certainly is that. I think we have time maybe for one, uh, one other question, and you were the, <coughs> the first to put your hand up there. Question for uh, both ministers. Um, Sweden has is having a tough time at the moment. They have a lot of problems in regards to the migrant crisis. Um, gang uh, violence has skyrocketed. There were 300 confirmed shootings last year alone. Um, the, there's 53 so-called no-go zones in Sweden. Sweden Prime Minister has uh, suggested that they bring in the army instead of the police to, to tighten things up. Does, does this situation concern you as a foreign minister and a minister of state for immigration and does it pose a threat to the future of Europe? You will start? Yeah, yeah the, um, the migration issue is uh, very much top of the agenda uh, in your <coughs> and, and meeting seven in Brussels and so on. It, it's there. Um, and I suppose we have to have a, your, your question is, is it a threat? Um, we have an integration policy here, a migration integration policy, and I'll share the passports on that. And one of, the, one of the things we've discovered is that integration is very, very important. And that means getting to know people, uh, making sure you don't have enclaves, making sure people don't feel isolated, um, making sure that when people come here from other countries, that they're welcome here, and that they feel at home. And that's, there's a lot of work involved in that and it covers a whole lot of different spheres. Now you have people who come in as refugees, as asylum seekers, and as, as legal migrants, different levels, and, and each of them then will have a different, we need, we need a different response to that. Uh, language acquisition is quite important. 
that people are able to communicate with each other. Um, at the moment, we're gathering refugees and asylum seekers. We're looking at community sponsorship, for instance, which is very, very successful in Canada. And as you know, Canadians welcome in migrants and refugees from in huge numbers. And they've integrated successfully. So a lot of it has to do with integration. And I maintain that if the integration is worked on and is successful and is embraced, then the threat that you mentioned uh, is dissipated and reduced considerably, and even maybe even eliminated. And I think that's important. But I think that the genesis of your question is we, we can't be complacent. We can't just say, well, people are coming, will come here and, and be able to think for themselves. We've got to help people to actually integrate, to make lives for, their, for, them, for themselves and for their children. And also, as all of your Lithuanian friends here, here know, and we have a lot of Lithuanians in, in Ireland at the moment, maybe between, I think, officially 36,000 and unofficially maybe even double that. But the Lithuanian community are integrating extremely well here, working very well in Ireland, are very welcome here, and are almost invisible in some ways, as I said to the ambassador last week. Uh, and, and that's what we'd like to see with other communities that they integrate, but not lose their own identity and their own culture either, which is also important. So it's challenging, definitely. So far in Ireland here, I think it's working pretty well. We, we don't have the kind of issues and problems that you've enunciated in Sweden. And I'm not sure whether there is as dramatic as what you've said, from what I've seen, but the ambassador is closer, the minister is closer to it, so perhaps he knows more about what's happening in Sweden than I do. But what I've seen, I don't think it's as, uh, as difficult as, as maybe we, we might have seen in some media reports. I am going to finish with the minister, but I'm wondering whether any of the students have any views on, on, on migration. Um, yep. Um, Rob. When we think of migration, uh, I suppose the first thing that comes into people's heads, uh, just off the top of their mind, might be the whole Syrian crisis and what we've seen in mm. 2015, 2016. Uh, but migration is happening all across the borders of Europe. Uh, the biggest number of migrants this year was actually from Africa, from countries such as Nigeria. So in terms of targeting that, um, the EU has to look at aid programs uh, in these areas uh, with regards to the people who are coming here. Um, it is quite complicated in the EU because of that Dublin regulation, of course, which at the crux of it was, uh, wherever you register to be an asylum seeker, that is where you have to stay, which has caused numerous problems for places like Greece, like Hungary, and uh, other places on the periphery of Europe, um, geographically speaking. So um, I know definitely the Hungarians had a, had a referendum two years ago, and now it was a very, it was a very poorly worded question, I think. Uh, but along the, it was along the lines of, should there be migrant quotas? Should countries take uh, certain levels of migrants in? Should, should migrants be shared, essentially, across the EU? Uh, that was almost unanimously rejected. 98.3% uh, of Hungarians said they did not want this to happen. So in terms of the migrant crisis, this is really, um, really, really, really hot topic when it comes to the future of Europe because um, certainly in these peripheral states, um, there's been massive issues. And these peripheral states are states which have had economic difficulties as well in the past. So I suppose in answer to the question of the whole migrant crisis, um, we have to look at helping uh, with the base factors, with the root causes of migration. We have to look at where these problems are coming from, what are causing these people to come here and uh, deal with it in that sense. Because if we deal with that base, uh, there won't be as much of an issue, there won't be these issues arriving uh, when these problems come to our shores. So I suppose that's just my Thanks, Rob. Now we uh, kicked off with the, with the Minister, so I think it's appropriate that uh, in this instance he'll get the, the last word. It's uh, the issue, one of the major challenges, uh, but not, not, uh, not in my country, because it's not a very hot issue for many reasons. We are not on this... Uh, track of uh, moving all these people and all, all, even those whom they are receiving, they are going uh, to Germany or also to Sweden. So you, they're not commodities, they're not criminals, they have a right to, to go and basically reuniting with the families, ma many other reasons. But in general terms I can tell that we are, our people are quite, uh, quite uh, well, normal attitudes with this phenomena, so to say. Maybe it's something in our genes, and you said the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, that multinational, multicultural religion, uh, so to say, atmosphere, it was always prevailing. But as I said, in our case, it's not a very hot, hot issue. But coming back to your question, it really could be a big threat if, if it's mismanaged, if not, not, not controlled, uh, because we really have to distinguish those who are refugees and running away from war zone. They must be treated adequately. And those who are looking basically for better life, uh, we cannot afford to... to uh, receive in Europe uh, everyone because uh, living standards in North Africa uh, differs from well developed European countries 40 times with all consequences uh, you know fees uh, subsidies uh, everything so it's uh, understandable not possible we have really to board, uh, to, to, to guard our borders more properly 
we really have to have this return policy also a active and uh, when it comes to the, with the, with the possible uh, criminal cases or terrorist cases, we really must uh, make sure that our intelligence services, they are sometimes very reluctant to, reluctant to interact, but they must cooperate also more closely. Uh, everything should be in parallel, not to get to the edges, uh, so to say. But uh, asking for my case, uh, it's not a hot issue in Lithuania so far. Okay. All right, Minister, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Minister yes. Stanton, Rob, Danielle, uh, Lee and Patrick. Um, I also have one or two others. Um, particularly like to thank UCC for hosting the event and Mary Murphy of the Department of Government and Politics. It's safe to say it would not, as I mentioned earlier, have happened without her. The Lithuanian Embassy and the Ambassador, who was mentioned on a, on a few occasions today. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who are also key in assisting with the organisation. Uh, also other people in attendance such as the Deputy Lord Mayor there, Councillor Fergal Dennehy, the UCC Vice President John O'Halloran and to thank you actually the audience for listening, I think it was really good quality listening uh, and I think that uh, reflects very well on the interest in the, in the subject matter but also I think on the preparation particularly on the part of our, our four students that, uh, that went into their topics and we certainly have all been left with uh, plenty of food for thought so thank you very much.